think we have a couple of fascinating speakers um, next uh, to. The next speaker is Eric McBain from MindBridge. MindBridge is a Canadian artificial intelligence firm, AI firm. And one of their products, specifically the AI auditor, is um, at this point a market leader for AI-powered audit tools. It's a rapidly evolving marketplace. Eric has the distinct pleasure of being in one of the companies that's at the early stage of one of those just fast moving, fast evolving parts of our industry. I forget the name of the law, but there's a law with regard to innovation that says that human beings tend to overestimate the impact of new technology in the short term, a three to five year period, but we also underestimate the impact of new technology over a longer term, a 10 or 15 year period. But I think it's pretty safe to say that whether we're fans of it or not, we're not going back to paper work papers. I think it's fabulous what we're starting to see with the AI investments. The, the big four are each investing massive amounts of money. And many in the middle market, including MyBridge, are also investing in AI tools that should benefit both uh, public uh, audit firms, but also uh, internal, uh, internal folks as well, whether it's internal audit, whether it's the office of the CFO, the controller, and so on. So Eric's gonna give us a little preview highlighting some of the areas where we'll see some use of AI in the audit process and practice. So with that, Eric McBain of MindBridge. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Well, well, what a fantastic crowd. And, and uh, you know, thank you for the, you know, the folks at Gross Minyanic Ford and, and Jeff for inviting us down to, uh, to talk a little bit about, about AI and, and uh, you know, some of the new techniques that are coming online that are really kind of transforming the way we do uh, the work that we do today. And so a little bit about myself, so I, I uh, after audit work, I, did, I actually ended up getting my CFA and I, I worked in uh, the kind of investment banking business for a number of years and we started this company, MindBridge, uh, probably about five years ago with the, the vision to create kind of an easy to use transaction analysis tool that can help us find that needle in the haystack, right? And so what I'm hoping to do today is just to kind of, you know, maybe scratch the surface about what's possible and really kind of get you guys thinking about as these new emerging technologies come online, how can we use those to win in our respective businesses? Because, you know, this isn't just external audit. This isn't just internal or CFO work. There's, this is far-reaching implications uh, in the economy because we live in a transaction-based system. If we can use technology to help us find risk and address it sooner, we do better. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the audit landscape, uh, you know, AI-powered risk scoring of transactional detail, and then kind of give you a little bit of visibility into a roadmap into how you can actually get started using this technology today. And I sh I'll be available afterwards if any of you guys wanted to, to ask any questions at all or, or um, you know, get into any of the details of, of what I'm talking about. Just going to get to this next slide here. Oh, okay. Today's audit landscape. So there's a couple, uh, a couple facets that point it over here. Okay. So common trends that we're seeing in, in the audit market, you know, we're really seeing a lot of fee pressure from, from audit committees, uh, a real shift to advisory services where, you know, let's outsource the low cognitive repetitive checking work to the machine and reallocate the human time up the value chain to spend more of our time on high value, high cognitive, client facing, stakeholder facing, board facing work, right? Let's get out of the weeds and, and into the more high level detail. You know, there's large audit failures that, that seem to be endemic across the globe. You're seeing every day, you know, whether it's a failure to, to act or failure to, to identify risks that end up bringing very large companies down. You know, Thomas Cook was a great example recently in, in the UK, and, you know, these are far reaching. Uh, and I actually wrote a blog post about this. You know, we're, we're looking at uh, an industry that's heavily reliant on audit sampling. What is sampling? Sampling, statistical sampling, is a coping mechanism. It's a workaround that we have used historically to deal with enormous data sets. You know, it's helped us interact with these populations uh, and just to be able to get by. But imagine today we're living in a world where we can use a machine to touch everything in a data set. It's allowing us to touch the granularity and to bring us up into, you know, show me where to look and show me what to look for 
and then I could go in and use my high value, high cognitive approach to address those risks. And I think retention of key talent is a huge issue that we hear from all of the firms that we deal with. You know, how can I get the young people, uh, millennials, excited about audit? You know, get people excited about using new techniques and technologies to win and to do better. That's what people want. They want exciting work. Just, uh, you may have to bear with me here. Okay, so, you know, if you look at, you know, the global perspective, you know, I... Um, you know, having lived in the, the capital markets domain for, for most of my 20s, you know, I used to follow this hedge fund manager, Ray Dalio. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of him, but he has a definition of the global economy as being just the aggregate of the transactions within it. You know, from the shopkeeper to the central banks, it's nothing but transactions. The exchange of value for currency is fundamental to every economic story. Everyone in this room interacts with transactions and recording every day, all day. This is what we do. And if you look at it, we have about $200 billion of financial loss that we know of. And if we look beyond that, you know, things that, and risk and, and transactional errors that we, we are undiscovered, there's about $4 trillion of efficiency that we can squeeze out of the global economy by using advanced pattern recognition, machine learning techniques to sort and sift and find the errors or intentional misstatements in that data. So there's a huge amount of value retention and extraction that can happen from using these advanced techniques. Just to give you kind of a high level picture of what we're talking about here. You know, if you look at the current tools that we use today, I kind of briefly talked about sampling. Sampling being this, this, this uh, you know, I, I read a book, this Daniel Kahn Kahneman wrote a book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and it talks about that law of large numbers. You know, we think as humans that the small sample is representative of the larger population. And that crutch in many ways, that workaround, gets us into a lot of trouble. You know, we, we as humans want things to kind of fit tightly into clean stories, to you know, be able to, to reach simple conclusions. And the reality is the world is complex. The world is difficult to fit into one kind of tidy box. So we need to use more advanced techniques to find and address risk in, in systems. You know, fraud, about 40% of fraud is caught by mistakes in tip lines. People calling in fraud, we're not detecting it, we're not finding it in large volumes. You know, about 3% of fraud today is caught by analytics. That's, that's a kind of an embarrassing number given in 2019 the amount of technology and, and horsepower, computational horsepower we have at our fingertips. You know, 16 months to detect fraud, we're finding it deeply in arrears, you know, way after the fact, you know, at a time when it's probably too late to do anything about it. And there's been a surge in fraud instance in the last 10 years because, surprise, surprise, the instigators and the committers of these offenses are using advanced technology. Wow. Well, we should probably increase you know, our toolkit and, and our um, access to technology to help combat these types of things. So AI-powered risk scoring, how did we get here? What is AI? You know, a lot of people have these kind of misconceptions about robots and the future and you know, what this actually looks like. So AI is actually a very old concept. This is something that was coined in 1956. And it's essentially this newfound ability of machines to learn from examples. You know, if you think about historical interaction with machines, if I want to get a machine to do something, I put two plus two in Excel, it gives me four, right? Very programmable, defined answers to define problems. Machine learning is this idea of, can I get a machine to learn on its own, to develop an understanding based on experience. You know, I use the example, many people in the room probably have kids, a child learning in the world, you know, making its way, touching the stove, you know, do less of that. Succeed, do something good, you do more of that, and you iterate through life learning as you go, right? Well, the key piece here is in the machine's world, the experiential equivalent is data, looking at large volumes of labeled data sets and learning to detect occurrences or recognize patterns in that data. So such a huge breakthrough, and we're only just beginning to harness the power of this. So these are some of the major breakthroughs along the way. You know, you have Deep Blue, the uh, chess game from IBM that beat Kasparov. I know a couple of you probably have seen the stuff with AlphaGo, DeepMind, you know, training the machine to play the, the Chinese board game Go and, and winning and beating Lisa Dahl. 
you know, all the way up to speech recognition. You know, how amazing is it that I can interact with my phone? You know, music playing in the car, I'm talking to, to my, my Android or iPhone, and it's recognizing with a very low error rate my voice. What's behind that? It's all, um, it's, it's optical character recognition and natural language processing, all of these advanced machine learning techniques that are helping us do better. Um, yeah, and if you think of you know, artificial intelligence, there's a lot of kind of misnomers. Artificial intelligence, AI, is this kind of large umbrella term within which you have all of these kind of sub-techniques. You know, machine learning is that learning, a newfound ability of machines to learn, and deep learning actually re specifically refers to something called neural networks, which is actually using the, the bio biological basis of the brain to create neural networks, deep neural networks, multi-layered networks to actually train these systems. So kind of using nature as a great example, we're actually mimicking the, the layout and the architecture of the brain to teach machines to do likewise. And you know, there's, there's this kind of realm of emerging technologies that are starting to interact with each other that are, that are, that are driving these major breakthrough, breakthroughs. So the four ones that I'm probably particularly most interested in is the Internet of Things, you know, actually putting at, at the periphery sensors and collecting huge amounts of data from the world we live in. Big data, this explosion in digital data in terms of complexity and size. You know, every interaction I have with my smartphone is creating this monstrous amount of data, which I can then use as training material to train these advanced machine learning systems. You have cloud computing, this, this infinite access to scalable, elastic cloud computing power that can allow me to solve any problem, you know, and for pennies. It, it's, it's infinitely cheap. And you know, the last of which being the machine learning. You know, using the three of these things to learn from the world we live in and to train systems to help us do better. Predictive machines. You know, one of the examples that I absolutely love is in the medical field. You know, they're training machine learning systems today to look at large volumes of MRI data and to actually detect positive occurrences of benign or malignant occurrences in the MRI data to a degree that's you know, tenfold better than any human could. You know, being Canadian, I play hockey every week, every Thursday night with all my buddies, and one of them is a, an emergency room doctor. He has a young family. He's one of the most poorly rested guys I've ever met. We need tools that he can have in his toolbox that help him make better decisions, right? And this is the technology that's doing that. You know, the, if you look at big data, this explosion, they say that, that uh, you know, 90% of the data we have generated as a civilization has been generated in the last two years. So this explosion in the creation of, of complex, uh, voluminous data, and it's moving very quickly. So we can actually use these, these kind of enormous data sets, if structured correctly, to train these machine learning systems. Very cool. And I referred to this at the, at the outset, but this is just to kind of frame the opportunity where we're pointing our AI technology at MindBridge is at transactions. Transactions being the exchange of value for currency. You know, what is a transaction? It, it is a line or a row in a, um, an Excel spreadsheet. It has a chronological date stamp, some type of account, and a value adjustment, a positive or negative number. Can we train a machine over billions of transactions to recognize high risk occurrences in those populations? Think about the banking world. Think about you know, asset management. I know there's some people from the financial domain. These, these are transaction heavy businesses and we're just throwing human bodies at the problem to say, well, we can't keep up with all the data that's being generated. Well, how about more people? Well, no, no, how about better technology, machine learning, pattern recognition? You know, that's the answer. You know, I think back to my, my early days as, a, as an auditor, I tell this story that I worked for a very low-tech savvy CPA partner. He did everything on seven-line ledger paper, didn't have an email address. You know, if I wanted to get a hold of John, I had to go into his office and wake him up. It was early days, and he'd give me a binder and a highlighter, and I'd be going through looking for transactions, and after about 50 transactions, I'm rethinking my career choice, right? I think a lot of people have been there, and the idea is humans are just bad at low cognitive, boring, repetitive checking work. You know, and, and people often say, hey, well, isn't AI going to replace, you know, the human auditor? 
Well, no, this is like an augmenting technology. This is not about replacing. This is, this is making us better. You know, I don't think anybody, and I, I don't know if this is an appropriate joke, but people talk about, you know, taking, you know, underage workers out of the coal mines. Like, that was bad work. We didn't want them doing that work. We want to bring machines in to do the low cognitive drudgery. And how does MindBridge do it? We utilize an ensemble, so that think of a portfolio, of codified rules, statistical methods, and machine learning algorithms. We sew them together into a, a blended portfolio, and we run digital transactions through a pipeline of different algorithms, and we risk score all the transactions in the data set, every single one, and then we use the result to surface interesting transactions for the human to investigate. Right? So instead of sampling a, you know, 5% or 10%, I'm touching everything in the population, and I'm showing the human where to look, right? Hugely powerful, game-changing, and I'm gonna to try to describe a few details as to why this is, this isn't just an improvement in what we did before, this is a stepwise game-changer where the people that have this technology are gonna run away with it, right? Like this is, this is no longer about competing. So, you know, look at these four categories. So these are the four categories of algorithms. If you look at even some of the more, most advanced uh, rules-based uh, computer-assisted audit tools today, they're all rules-based. They're, they're yes-no questions of the data. Is it cash? Is it not? Is it a weekend post or not? These binary elements, right? And so what we do is we chain those domain rules, those business rules, those are, those are things that, you know, if you and I, sir, were looking through a data set and we're trying to find something, what are the things that we would be interested in? Can we capture that or codify that into a, into a rule? And we combine that with statistical methods like machine learning algorithms, uh, how rare is the transaction, to what degree is it an outlier in the data set. And by sewing them all together into this ensemble, I can then begin surfacing these transactions from the data set. You know, you think about this, this kind of archetypal iceberg analogy, you know, what's lurking beneath the surface? You know, if you think about rules-based analytics, that's the, uh, that's the yes, no pieces. What's the problem with rules in isolation? Well, in order for me to create a rule to find a risk in a data set, I, I first of all need to know what I'm looking for. You know, if you look at people using these applications in financial markets, I don't know what the risk is going to be 24 hours from now, let alone two weeks. It's such a dynamic, changing system. I need to be able to surface things that I don't even know I'm looking for. So how do we do that? By combining rules with things like how rare is a transaction, uh, to what degree is it an outlier, um, using machine learning to say, I've seen this type of transaction a thousand times and it's always bad. So I basically am able to surface the transaction detail without having any pre-existing knowledge that it exists. What a breakthrough, right? That's gonna allow us to unleash these technologies on large data populations and tell it to bring it back, bring us what we think, you think we should be looking for. And that's where we spend our time. No one's gonna get paid to find risk in 2020. You know, we're going to get a machine to find the risk and then we're gonna bring a human in to go further, go deeper, you know, answer the question, why is it there? How can we prevent it in the future? Hopefully this is making sense for you guys. Um, next slide here. Yes, yeah, so if you look at our kind of flagship AI product, so we are a software as a service company. We sell access to our cloud-based portal. Our users will drag and drop general ledger detail into the system. Our system will run it through the pipeline and find all the high-risk items and then surface those transactions in a high, medium, low-risk view. But then think about once you've ingested the digital data, well, wow, there's all sorts of cool stuff we can do that now, or do with that now. I can do a ba balance sheet, income statement. You know, I think about it as a CFA, I can, I can create a cash flow statement. I can begin talking about valuation, you know, free cash flow analysis. You know, I can continue to take the insights further and deeper. And, and this is where we're going. So, you know, we're very much the first, the only AI-powered audit technology in the market. We've got about 500 global clients using the technology today. About 40 of the top 100 CPA firms in the US are using the technology on audits. And it's a very exciting place to be. Um, there's just tons and tons of, of work. Uh, and the way we end up winning this race is by bringing domain experts and pairing them with technicians, right? The computer programmers aren't the people that are gonna build the winning tool. 
It's computer programmers with the domain experts defining what the problem looks like. Hey, you know, have we thought about it this way? Like, you know, this is the audit, this is how I do my audit, this is my methodology. How can we use AI in that context to, to do better? You know, this is kind of an interesting chart, and you know, I'd encourage you guys to take a picture of this. This is actually, you know, the way of thinking about the analytics cycle, right? So we're collecting all of this data. There's, there's a huge data collection effort. And you know, we generate these large lakes of data. We can then run data analysis. We can extract insight, knowledge, and understanding, and then use that as a de decision-making aid, right? Think about MindBridge as, as this decision-making aid that helps us make better decisions. You know, I, I read an interesting book recently that broke out the human decision into two components. There's a predictive element, and then there's human judgment. You know, historically, the predictive element was intuition, was, you know, we'd, we'd do some rough math, we'd have some computational back of the envelope to kind of get a rough prediction of the future. What we're doing now is we're using advanced machine learning tools as the predictive component that's telling me, well, there's a 98% chance that what you're looking at in this MRI image is a malignant tumor. I can say as a doctor, okay, wow, yeah, that's a very statistically significant, very confident. Now I'll bring in my training, my judgment, and say, I'm now gonna make a diagnosis. Similarly, in the audit world, I can use these decision-making aids to make better decisions, right? In the audit world, this is all about finding risk, identifying risk, addressing risk, communicating risk. So you can start to think of all of these machine learning tools as decision-making aids. You know, I, I mentioned very briefly that traditional audit with kind of a rules-based or, or statistical sampling is kind of a limited coverage. You know, there's, there's these huge blind spots that are lurking that we're not touching at all, right? And with sampling specifically, you know, we're shining light on a very small corner of transactional data. You know, imagine a world now where we're able to touch 100% of the data. We're able to have 100% granularity, and then to, to focus in on those areas of highest risk, not just kind of ad hoc stumbling through a population and, and hoping for the best. You know, there's not just uh, effectiveness gains, but there's huge efficiency benefits, right? We're able to do this faster, cheaper, you know, less resources. Um, yeah, this is kind of attacking a number of different dimensions of, of the business. You know, people are also using this technology as, as a competitive differentiator. You know, if I'm going into an RFP process or I'm bidding on new work, you know, I want to be differentiated as an AI-enabled firm of the future. I don't want to go in and say, hey, we've got some of the best seven-line ledger paper you've ever seen. Like, we've got stacks of the stuff. Um, you know, you want to be able to say, no, we've got, we've got the best tools. We've got the best people. You know, we're going to help you win because your clients are trying to win in their respective businesses. They probably expect the same from you. So I'm just going to slip through here. Um, kind of mentioned a little bit about machine learning, but I want to talk about a couple, you know, as this is kind of an introductory discussion around AI, talk about some of the techniques. You know, we use tools like clustering. So clustering is a, is a machine learning technique that we use in our technology. And it's essentially grouping sets of objects such, a, such that those objects or transactions in the group are more similar to those in their group than into other groups. So we can actually cluster these transactions into risky categories, into uh, certain risk buckets. Chronologically, we can understand are there certain you know, clusters of high risk transactions that are occurring throughout the, the calendar year. And so if you use this in general ledger data, clusters can be based on dollar amounts of the monetary flow, you know, source and destination of the monetary flow, number of flows that occur alongside that transaction, and, and critically, the proximity of the flows transactions to some period in time, right? So you can see how we can begin using machines to cluster the transactions into relevant categories and using those categories to extract more insight. So, you know, you think of this, this uh, there's a couple different pieces of, of our technology, but also of these, these risk prediction modules or, or prediction machines that are, that are in the market. You know, there's AI detection, so that's kind of finding the needle in the haystack. So instead of me having to kind of, 
you know, look for that really random occurrence, I can actually use the machine to point me there. There's predictive modeling, which is this idea of, well, hey, if I've got five years of historical data for a client, can I begin developing some kind of predictive understanding of where certain accounts are going? You know, how, where, how revenue is unfolding. Can I then become a strategic advisor to my clients to say, hey, you know, not only did I, I you know, perform an audit, but I've, I've got a very good insight into the health of your business, and you know, have we thought about maybe migrating into this higher margin you know, business line? This is, this is an area of interest, and you know, here's what the data looks like. Here's the data I'm looking at. You know, visualizing this, making complex data understandable. You know, a lot of us are visual learners and we need an ability to be able to, to contextualize what's been discovered, right? If I gave you a flat file, some big large Excel spreadsheet with 13,000 entries, that's not intuitively speaking to me. You know, I can scroll through, you know, with like the best of them, but it, there's nothing in there that I can understand. Convert that to a graph or a visualization, you know, give me some kind of predictive risk scoring, I can begin understanding what's happening. So I'm actually going to move more to um, uh, you know, discussion of how we can actually start integrating this into, um, in, into, the, yeah, in, into your business line, right? So we have, a, we have kind of an interesting graphic that we generated here, and I think this may be a, a, you know, worth spending a little bit of time discussing. So you know, if you kind of look at how we kind of test hypothesis as a human, we have you know, theories about specific clients or certain occurrences that we're trying to validate. You know, we use patterns, so patterns for this person, you know, patterns for the same user role, right? We can detect uh, more frequent or, or infrequent users. And then we have specific, you know, algorithm-specific uh, insights that we can use at, more an, at an algorithmic level. And this, these, these things all kind of inform our decision-making process. And if you look at kind of historically, humans are very bad at, at uh, intuitive statistical decision makers, right? We, uh, we, we want things to kind of fit tightly and neatly into a, into a bucket. You know, we're very, I think, uncomfortable with complexity and, and things that aren't kind of clean answers. You know, we, we need to be able to kind of harness uh, machine learning and advanced statistical tools to make sense of the complicated world we live in. You know, and not just kind of jump to conclusions and, and, and put something in a category because it's tidy. Um, yeah, and one of the other, you know, I think I'd mentioned this, this idea of, of ensemble AI techniques. So, you know, I, I want to kind of tell a story about how we use ensembles. And so an ensemble is a, is a statistical and, and machine learning technique that, that we utilize. Um, that actually is a much, creates a very strong predictor of risk. And, and the analogy I'll use here is, you know, you've all got your 401ks, and what's the, f the, the only free lunch in finance? Diversification. You never put all your eggs in one basket, right? That's kind of a, a, a no-brainer. Similarly, you know, there's some analogies and some parallels to the machine learning world in that, you know, if you use one type of test, let's say Benford's Law, and I do risk scoring and analysis based on just Benford's law. I'm exposed to the good, the bad, and the ugly of Benford's law. And what, what is that? Benford's law produces a lot of false positives, right? If there's a statistical accident and you know, there's a certain sequence of numbers that occurs more frequently. So I kind of jump to the conclusion that this is a risky transaction, but it's just a statistical accident, right? It's, a, it's actually a false positive. It's flagged this incorrectly. How can I combat that? Well, similarly to diversifying my investment portfolio, I can actually add additional types of algorithms to an ensemble and create a blended risk score. So there's an old rule in, in the data science world that you can combine a variety of weak predictors of risk to create a strong predictive system. And by chaining together Benfers with things like how rare is the transaction, um, you know, looking at different kind of chronological rules, I can actually blend away the weakness of Benford's, which is the false positives, and I can isolate the benefit of that statistical test in tandem with all of the other tests in that portfolio. So I hope that makes sense. Like we can actually continue to add weekend post, high dollar value, manual entry, and to create an intersection where all of these algorithms that are firing on that one transaction and positively identifying it will help add context to why we need to investigate it. You know, there's another dimension in, in machine learning called explainability. 
you know, AI systems can't just be this black box that we kind of feed data in one end and we kind of blindly take the results out the other side and your client asks you, hey, you know, this is high risk, why? Well, the machine said so. Well, no, we need to actually be able to understand the machine's mechanism so that we can explain to our clients, why did we pick this? So in the MindBridge world, within our tool, you can drill down infinitely into the detail. You know, if I pull aside a transaction that has a 57% risk score, high risk transaction, you know, money moving out of the bank account into bad debt write-off, you know, some type of cash box fire of some sort. I need to be able to explain, well, why did MindBridge score this 57%? And you go deeper and it says, well, hey, this, this tripped as a, a cash transaction. This is a rare flow. This is a high monetary value. So in my terms, my human terms, I can understand why the system has pulled this aside and I can communicate it critically to a stakeholder, to a client. And that's a critical piece that I, I kind of want to plant with you guys, that there's a lot of complexity around these AI systems and there's certain pieces that we need to get right. You know, explainability is one. Bias is another that I wanted to spend some time on. You know, there's a lot of really interesting examples in the banking world and, and lending kind of credit extension world where people are using machine learning systems to extend credit. And depending on the data source and the demographic breakout of the data source, I may end up discriminating against certain borrowers by virtue of bias within my data. That's something we can't really have, right? We need to be able to create systems that are unbiased in their decision making and don't take into effect certain things like gender or race or other things that I think we've worked so hard historically to kind of uh, you know, combat those discrimin you know, discriminatory uh, processes or, or structures in our society. So these are some of the elements that we really have to think about as we build these systems. Um, I'm actually going to skip. These are a little more complex. And yeah, if you guys ever wanted to go really deep dive into this stuff, you know, I'd be happy to kind of pull a call with you guys and we can kind of talk more deeply about you know, the nitty gritty, maybe some of the specific algorithms. You know, one of the things I wanted to do now is maybe spend a little bit of time talking about some of the really interesting adaptations of this technology within different domains. You know, the financial services sector being one of them. You know, so if you think of, about how MindBridge has evolved, we, we started as, as you know, the sharp tip of the spear for us was the audit and assurance business. We really said, hey, you know, this is a very low-hanging fruit opportunity. We can take large volumes of general ledger data, we can run those transactions through this pipeline of algorithms, risk score the transactions, and create a very useful appliance for the external auditor to solve all these very painful problems, to overcome these large data sets. But then as we kind of started going deeper, a lot of our clients said, hey, well, I've got you know, these financial services clients, I have a bank that's got a credit union that has all of this data, this transactional data, and hey, here's an interesting use case that they, they want to solve. So we started going deeper into deposits and lending, insurance, investment management, you know, capital markets, market infrastructure. And as you can imagine, this is, you know, at the core of what we do, we do transaction risk scoring, transaction analysis. So there's all sorts of really interesting places where this can be pointed. And I wanted to kind of you know, pique your interest just on some of those examples. So you know, in the next slide, um, you know, consider this is one of our, our interesting use cases. Uh, the Bank of England is a large client of ours. And so when I worked in, in the bond trading business in 2008, there was something called the LIBOR fixing scandal. And I think you know, probably a couple of you guys in the room know, know about this. LIBOR is, is supposed to be kind of an unadulterated free market US dollar interest rate offshore so that it doesn't have any influence of US monetary policy. And the way that LIBOR or the London Interbank Offer Rate was historically calculated was all of the big major global banks would send to the Bank of England on a daily basis what they would pay to borrow money for three months in US dollars. And they would get rid of the top 5% trim the bottom 5% and they would average the middle and that would be the LIBOR fix. And LIBOR underpins trillions of dollars of global floating rate bonds, interest rate derivatives, also it's, it's probably one of the most important numbers in the world I would argue. And so the problem that the Bank of England has is, is they said, you know, we're having a hard enough time just generating LIBOR every day. Our analysts are just struggling to get that number out. How do we detect bad behavior or nefarious activity 
in the generation of this LIBOR number. And what was actually happening is the bad boys and girls of banking, uh, the Deutsche Banks, the J J Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, they were all getting together and they were in a Bloomberg chat room. They were colluding to fix the LIBOR rate in their favor, in their benefit. So what we had to do is say, how can we sniff out this bad behavior and, and address it? And so we showed the, the tool, the MindBridge AI Auditor, to the Bank of England, and they said, hey, you know, can we use this technology and develop custom algorithms to ingest all of the submissions, the LIBOR submissions, and detect things like correlated bidding? You know, if, if Goldman and Barclays are, are bidding in a correlated way over a three-month period, I can suspect that they're probably communicating behind the scenes, right? Uh, can I t test for certain um, submissions that unduly influence the next day's LIBOR fixing? And the answer is absolutely. So we built this appliance for them that actually helped them sniff out and detect bad behavior. And it actually underpins what's called SONIA, the Sterling Overnight Index Average, which is now the replacement for LIBOR. So just a cool example about how adaptable and, and what we call extensible this technology is, you know, if you think about what we built for the Bank of England, that's 98% genetically identical to the AI auditor. It's just a slight adaptation, a slightly different transactional data set, but at the core, it's just risk scoring transactional data. So, you know, the opportunity here is enormous. You know, another really cool example that I love to, to give is uh, one of the large commercial banks in Canada had an issue. Uh, one of the biggest banks in Canada, they have 800 branches coast to coast, National Bank of Canada. They came to us, we showed them the, the MindBridge AI auditor, they said, wow, very cool. But we've got this problem with our branches. Um, the way we're doing the internal audit of the branch network is it's purely on a calendar rotation. We start in Vancouver and we work our way and we just rotate through all 800 branches and after three years when we're done, we start again at the top and we just rotate through. And they're saying, we're just stumbling upon risk in a very ad hoc way. There's, there's no rhyme or reason to how we're going about risk detection. We're just rotating through on a geographic basis. So they said, can we take all the, the transactional detail running through the branch network? This is trillions of dollars worth of transactions running through a physical branch network that's coast to coast. Can we take all that transactional detail and risk score all the transactions flowing through all the branches? bolt in things like alternative data sets, like uh, performance information, retirement detail, things that are non-transactional that we can augment, and then score these branches so that we can actually start with the riskiest branch and work our way to the least risky. So what a better way of approaching risk detection and internal audit by seeking out the riskiest entities and then working your way to the least risky. Just a, a better way of thinking about that. You know, and you can also think about you know, this being far-reaching in any of the businesses you guys run. Any business unit, we can actually take digital transactions, run them through the pipeline, and tell you where your riskiest geography is, your riskiest salesperson, um, your riskiest product lines. There's, there's just an infinite amount of customization here. And so hopefully that's just kind of like whetting the appetite of what, you know, what's possible here. And then you know, I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about kind of a roadmap to AI. You know, this is kind of a, a lot of complicated stuff getting discussed here. But how do we actually get started? You know, what is the kind of bread and you know, how do we day one just kind of start using this? And I'll just kind of hopefully illuminate, illuminate a little bit about what is kind of most fundamental, I think, in the successful companies that we've worked with, like a gross Minianic Ford, uh, some, of, some of the pioneers in the use of this technology in the industry really comes down to this kind of change mindset, this, this understanding that you know, we have to embrace change at all levels. We need to empower people from the managing partner all the way down to the, the people coming out of college that you know, it's, it's the whole what's in it for me thing, right? Why would this be interesting for me? And so to scale up AI, companies must make three shifts. This is a Harvard Business Review. From siloed work to interdisciplinary collaboration. From experience-based, leader-driven decision-making to data-driven decision-making at the front line. From rigid and risk-averse, you know, this is the way we've done it, this is the way we're going to do it, no thank you, to an agile, experimental, adaptable mindset. And I was having breakfast with a gentleman today, we were talking about Blockbuster, and 
you know, there's a lot of really interesting things happening within uh, the CPA and, and AI CPA and within the, the accounting industry in the US. And then there's this whole idea of self-disruption, this idea of we can't wait for the market to change, to, to, to move us to change. We need to almost self-disrupt and create solutions to problems ourselves. We can't really, we don't have the luxury of waiting for the market to kind of move, blow past us. And things are moving at such a fast pace now, you kind of think of the Blockbuster example. Instead of just digging their heels in Blockbuster and renting videos, hey, maybe you start experimenting with online distribution, right? Looking at different channels, thinking, hey, the way we've always done things could be different in the future. You know, having kind of an agile mindset to say, we got to think critically about what this is going to look like, and we can't just rest on how it's been done historically. So the AI adoption journey in MindBridge is kind of broken up into a couple phases. You know, we, we look at this first phase of just explore and engage. Like, how can we just get comfortable with what this is? You know, this is new and exciting, but can we just kind of get our hands on it? Can we, can we get a base hit? You know, we don't really want to go for the big grand slam. We just want to get on base. And that's the idea of let's get a couple different engagements. Let's do a limited trial and just start playing with this. Then we kind of look at more enabling and expanding, right? Kind of, you know, build on that ground gained, right? Use those, you know, if I look at a national CPA firm, you know, if I've been rolling it out in one national office, can I start pushing what's worked out to some of the more regional offices? Embedding and empowering, you know, start looking at the methodology and saying, hey, you know, where within this methodology can we start moving faster and, and, and deeper? Where can we start using AI to, to win and to do better? And evolve. Evolving is now just thinking about this technology as, as a core piece of your business. It's this whole idea of AI first. A lot of the banks and corporates in America are thinking, we've got to put AI at, at the core of our business. You know, we are going to be an AI company. This is going to touch all of the industries that we work in, there's no doubt. Um, there's been some really cool work that C3 has done with Baker Hughes around totally disrupting the oil and gas industry, you know, putting sensors at the periphery using things like Internet of Things and IoT to do things like predictive maintenance. Like, there's just some incredible applications of this technology uh, that's touching everything. So because Evolve, you know, and, and really the piece about Evolving is a lot of our clients are kind of coming in with us and saying, hey, I want to be a co-architect in how this technology is built out. I actually want to get involved and help dictate where this goes. So really becoming um, design partners and helping us build out modules for their respective industries, you know, working on a lot of cool things in the credit union space. Credit unions come to us and they say, hey, you know, the big guys are too big to fail, but we're too small to win. Um, we need tech partners to help us navigate and to compete with the bigger national uh, banks in the country. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of the CPA firms that we work with can kind of wrap around the credit unions to say, we can provide a lot of the ancillary services that can help you harness and get the power to something like MindBridge. And so I don't really have to go into a huge ton of detail here on, on each of the levels, and I can kind of go into it deeper with you. But one of the things I did want to mention, and we're just kind of running up on, on the top of the hour here, is we're doing something very cool with the universities. And I wanted to share this with you. And I know, you know most people within this room you know, have a kind of post-secondary education, and this would kind of, uh, I think, really resonate. So we have something called the MindBridge University Program. Uh, and what we've done is we've approached universities around the world and said, hey, you know, can we give you the technology for free to use within the um, curriculum? So, you know, we partnered with Duquesne, for example, and as part of their Masters of Accountancy program and said, you know, hey, can we, can we just give you MindBridge and help you use this as part of your, your data analytics component of your master's program? And they're like, Ab absolutely. Like, this is something we need to start getting people excited about the future of the industry and training the AI-enabled auditors of the future. And there's a couple different edges of, of this sword here that I want to tell you about. So you think about a large CPA firm like uh, you know, Grossman Yannick Ford, for example. So think about this scenario. They basically are users of the technology and, and are using uh, MindBridge on audits today. All right? What is very difficult in the audit industry today is, is finding good talent, right? Is finding people that want to work, that are excited about audit. 
So think about Gross being the Anik Ford going into the classroom and giving an example of, hey, this is how we're using robots and machines and exciting things in our firm. You know, what do you think is happening? All of the excited best students in the class are coming up and trying to get business cards because they want to work at the firm that's got the best technology that's going to give them that leg up in their careers. So there's all sorts of really good benefits, and we have about 80 different universities and colleges within the US using our technology in the classroom. Totally pro bono, for free. We're just excited that we can get this technology into the hands of people that are thinking differently about um, about audit, about uh, AI, and, and um, sorry, I'm going to skip to the last slide here. Are you able to help me get to the end? Can you just help me get to the end there if, if you can? Oh, takeaways. Okay, so just in the last minute or two here, I wanted to just kind of wrap up with, you know, and capture what we've discussed today. So obviously, there's a lot of very exciting technology coming online. And it's changing everything we do. You know, the current approaches to audit, and I, I mean this with all due respect, are, are outdated and I think need to conform to meet today's business environment. We can use advanced tools to, to, to augment our approaches and to do better. An AI system can take on many of the tedious tasks of an audit, like data processing, risk scoring, searching, filtering, confirmations, et cetera with the human auditor focusing on the task too complex for the AI. So that's uh, communicating results with clients, you know, relationship building. You know, people often ask me, they say, hey, Eric, you, you know, you work in AI, what job do you think is most um, least susceptible to being replaced? You know, jobs that have creativity, human interaction, sales, business development, client-facing roles are always going to be in demand. You know, we may have uh, this kind of outsourcing of some of the low cognitive kind of drudgery back office roles, but there's always going to be a demand for people to be able to take a complicated topic, results from some complicated system, and to communicate it effectively to the stakeholder. And lastly, I'd say adopting an AI-powered tool is a journey. You know, start small, expand, use AI as, as you and your team become more confident. You know, don't try to bat the grand slam out of the park, just try to get you know, quick win, a base hit, and build on that. So, you know, with that, I, I uh, think I'll just wrap up and uh, open it up to, um, you know, Jeffrey, I know you guys have a break coming up, but maybe I could put my contact information or at least make it available to you guys if you guys wanted to chat about AI or talk about some of the different technologies, if you had some opinions about what this is going to do or places where you're seeing it. I am a bit of an enthusiast and would kind of love to have that conversation. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope it wasn't, uh, I hope it was better than the tax one at least maybe. <laughs> All right.